So we're part of a team at the Institute of Biomedical Engineering in Oxford, and we're working on trying to develop better ways to deliver drugs. And the motivation for our work can really be summed up in three slides. Over the past, or not, uh, there we go. Um, over the past 20 years, there's been an absolutely staggering increase in the amount of money that's been spent on developing drugs. These data are deliberately historical for reasons we'll see, um, and there was a little bit of a blip for the financial crisis, but every indication is these figures are going up rapidly yet again. What's perhaps surprising is the impact on the number of drugs that are being approved and make it into the clinic is doing exactly the opposite. It's going down. And the figure for last year was bubbling around the 20 again. I'm showing figures for the US because it is still by far the largest market, but this is pretty reflective worldwide. What's perhaps more depressing is the impact this is having on healthcare is even more limited. So I'm choosing cancer as an example because that's what I want to focus on later in the talk. The instance of cancer has been going up, it's continuing to go up, it's leveling off a little bit, but this is very patchy. We're making huge advances in the treatment of breast cancer and prostate cancer, but in other types of cancer, we're having limited effect altogether, and our effect on mortality, similarly, it's flatlining. These drugs, though they're making it to the clinic, they're not actually impacting these very serious diseases. Why? Well, there are lots of reasons. We do have an aging population, and unfortunately it's true, as you get older, you are more likely to get sick. But a lot of these statistics are adjusted for age. One of the problems with developing these more advanced drugs is they are much more expensive. They're available to fewer people. The other thing we're realizing as we develop more um, advanced drug systems is actually the number of patients for whom they are effective is also smaller. They're brilliant for a small number, but that number, unfortunately, is not reflected the entire population. But actually, in most cases, there is absolutely nothing wrong with the drugs whatsoever. It's the way we deliver them that's the problem. Currently, if you have to take some form of medicine, it's going to be normally in the form of injection or a pill. We give some drugs through the skin, some through inhalation, but pretty much it's going to be directly into the bloodstream. And what that means is that the drug circulates around the body. Most of the tissues in the body are exposed to that drug. And this can have a number of different effects. For some drugs, that's absolutely fine. For some drugs, it's exactly what we want. But what it means is that only a very, very tiny proportion of what we put into the bloodstream is actually making it to our target site, for example, to a tumour. Typically, the amount of an injected drug taken up by a tumour is less than 1%. The rest of that drug is going elsewhere in the body, and unfortunately, this is why we get these very severe side effects from chemotherapy. It's actually worse than that. If we look, this is a slice taken through a cancerous tumour. This is from my colleagues in Oxford. And what you'll see is the red is where the blood vessel has transported the drug. Blue are the cancer cells. Green are the ones that we've successfully treated. And the real problem is, is when we put these drugs into the bloodstream, they're not diffusing into the tumour. We're treating the cells around the blood vessels. We're not treating the rest. And that's why we get quite severe recurrence. So what can we do about this? We're engineers. We need to find a solution. We need to find some way both of getting the drug more effectively to where it needs to go and distributing it throughout the tissue. And that's where bubbles come in. Now, before any scuba divers in the audience start to panic, I'm not proposing giving everyone the bends. Um, to reassure you, bubbles have actually been used very successfully in ultrasound imaging for several decades now. Uh, so these tiny bubbles, they're injected into the bloodstream. And what you're seeing here is a scan of the liver. And as the bubbles are washing into the bloodstream, they're reflecting the ultrasound. And hopefully what you'll be able to see is the blood vessels start to stand out. So this is very useful diagnostically for clinicians diagnosing a number of diseases in cardiovascular disease and cancer. The crucial point is these bubbles are very, very tiny. They're smaller than a red blood cell. So they're about, they're about a 50th of a human hair. They can pass safely through the bloodstream without the risk of causing a blockage. Now, the reason they work is they're full of gas, they're bubbles. So when we expose them to an ultrasound field, changing pressure, these bubbles start to pulsate. They expand and they contract. That produces very strong ultrasound echoes, which is what enables us to see them on an ultrasound scan. It's exactly that same effect that we're exploiting for improving drug delivery. So what we're seeing in this image, down on the left-hand side, is a real image of a real bubble. This is taken with an ultra-high-speed camera and it's pulsating in the ultrasound field. What you're seeing on the right-hand side is the liquid around the bubble. 
We've doped this liquid with some fluorescent nanoparticles, and you see we're developing this swirling pattern. As the bubble pulsates, it pumps the drug around it. And the crucial thing to notice is the bubble is only a couple of micrometers in diameter. The distance over which it can transport the drug is 200, 200 micrometers, so 100 times that. So we can really push the drug deep into the tissue and hopefully have a better chance of treating tumours. Even better than that, we can use these bubbles as vehicles for drug delivery. Because they are very, very tiny, there's an incredibly high surface tension acting uh, at the interface between the gas and the liquid trying to dissolve the bubbles. So we have to coat them with something to stop them from disappearing too quickly. And that coating gives us a platform to which we can attach drugs. So we can temporarily deactivate a drug, it's injected into the bloodstream, and then we can release it at the target site using ultrasound. So we can localise the delivery of that drug and then exploit this pumping effect to get it into the tissue. The other thing we can do is we can attach molecules to the surface of the bubble that will make it sticky to particular types of cells. So we can localise them before we do the drug delivery. Now we're looking at this technology in a number of different areas. The one I want to focus on today though is a collaboration with the University of Ulster, a team led by John Callan and Tony McHale, looking at the treatment of pancreatic cancer. And hopefully this graph speaks for itself as to why this is our target. And what's probably more depressing about these statistics is these survival rates haven't improved in 40 years. Now, one of the huge challenges with pancreatic cancer is, unfortunately, it's usually diagnosed far too late. Patients are already very, very ill, and they can't tolerate either surgery or aggressive chemotherapy. So the reason we're working with the team in Ulster is they want to use a very specific type of drug which only becomes active, it only becomes toxic to cells when it's been activated by ultrasound. Now, we can focus ultrasound down to a very, very tiny region, about the size of a grain of rice. So we have fantastic localization of the activity of this drug. We can minimize side effects elsewhere in the body. And these drugs are actually already being used. They're so-called photodynamic therapy drugs. Um, they're activated with a laser currently for treating skin cancer. Uh, what the team in, in Ulster and some teams in Japan have shown is they can also be activated by ultrasound. The huge advantage there is we can propagate ultrasound several centimetres or tens of centimetres into the body, whereas, as I'll demonstrate with a laser, we can't get more than a couple of millimetres. The way this works is by generating these very, very reactive species. The big downside is that in order to do that, we have to have oxygen present. And one of the big hallmarks of very aggressive tumours, such as we see in pancreatic cancer, is oxygen is in very, very short supply. The cells very rapidly become deprived of the bloodstream and hence of oxygen. And this is why we've teamed up, because if we can deliver the drug on a bubble, we can fill that bubble with oxygen, so we can provide that payload that's needed for the drug to be active simultaneously. Uh, as with all the best collaborations, this, this was born in a pub, um, and quite late after a conference, I was asked, could we use some of our bubbles? Would we be able to put oxygen and put the drug in? And I went, of course, yeah, that's easy. We just substitute the gas. There'll be no problem at all. Nine months later, I deeply regretted saying that. There was a huge amount of chemistry involved in actually engineering these bubbles. The reason people use the gases they do for ultrasound contrast agents is they're very insoluble and they're very large molecules. This is not true of oxygen. But we got there in the end. And this, these were our preliminary results. These are from a couple of years ago um, now in a pancreatic tumour. And what you'll see here is these are incredibly aggressive tumours. They, they double their volume in a week if they're untreated. What we saw, the pink line here, is when we were delivering the drug on a normal bubble, so not containing oxygen. We did have some effect initially, but very quickly the tumour started to regrow. There isn't enough oxygen for the drug to be effective. When we deliver the drug with oxygen, however, we see a significant shrinkage in the tumour volume. And the reason this is important, if this was in a human patient, this could be the difference between them being able to receive surgery or not. But this was in a mouse model. It's very unrealistic, and we're directly injecting the bubbles into the tumour. So although we were excited, we're a very, very long way from the clinic. What we needed to go back and look at was a way of concentrating these bubbles so they could actually be injected into the bloodstream, held at the target site before we activated the drug. We looked at a lot of different ways of doing this. So we're tagging our drug molecules onto the bubble. We have oxygen in the center. We had to develop a new coating that would encapsulate the oxygen. 
the new component was adding magnetic nanoparticles into these microbubbles. This enables us to concentrate the bubbles at our target site before we expose them to ultrasound. Now, the reason we chose a magnetic approach over a chemical approach, so putting molecules on the bubble to make them sticky, I'll illustrate in the next slide. So these are bubbles being flown into two fake blood vessels. On the left-hand side, we've made the blood vessels sticky, so the bubbles will catch, and you can see some of them getting stuck to the surface. But on the right-hand side, we've used a magnet to target them. And so it was a simple question of efficiency. We can get a few tens of bubbles stuck chemically. We can get millions of bubbles stuck using a magnet. And these are some results which we published earlier this year, where we've used this magnetic targeting approach to enable delivery. These are now being injected systemically into our animal model. We're com confining them with a magnet, and we're then looking at the delivery. And what we see, if we don't have the targeting, we actually don't have a very significant effect at all. But with the magnetic targeting, we're able to achieve the shrinkage in the tumor. And more importantly, on the right-hand side, we're able to demonstrate that we're getting cell death. We're actually destroying these cancer cells. They're not going to come back. However, this is still working in an animal model. And one of the big problems with using magnetic targeting is the force that you can get from a magnet falls off very, very rapidly with distance. It actually falls off with a cube of distance. So proving this works in a mouse is not telling us a huge amount about what will happen in patient. So in parallel, what we've been working on is checking whether this is going to be feasible on a human scale. Starting very simply in the lab in a tank of water, we have a little block of gel representing tissue with a tube running through it that we pump the bubbles through. And we're imaging those bubbles under ultrasound. And we have a magnet underneath that we gradually increase the distance to see at what point we can still trap bubbles. And this is what we see on the ultrasound scanner. So what you're seeing, the bubbles start to flow through. They're getting pulled down. I have no idea where it's flashing like that. They're getting pulled down onto the magnet. And the reason the bottom of the tube is lighting up white is because we're trapping a lot of bubbles there. So this was great. Um, we were able, pretty confident that we'd be able to do this at depths of up to seven, seven, eight centimetres, which is more than enough than we need to treat the pancreas. The real test, though, was to go into something a bit more realistic. Um, I apologise. Uh, hopefully it's sufficiently far between breakfast and lunch to show these images. This is an amazing system that my colleague, Constantin Kousios and Peter Friend in Oxford have developed. It's designed for keeping transplantation organs alive um, so they can... Uh, we, they have much better organ preservation for transplant patients. We're using it as a system for looking at drug delivery in what is as close to a human as we possibly can. And we basically repeated the experiment. So we're pumping our bubbles into one of these blood vessels. We have the magnet sitting underneath about five centimetres away. And to our intense relief at about three o'clock in the morning, we see this very nice lighting up at the bottom of the vessel showing that we've been able to trap bubbles uh, on something approaching a human scale. So where next? Well, um, I've spent the last seven years of my career on an almost vertical learning curve, going from thinking getting the science right was the main challenge in helping human health, and realizing that's only the first challenge. Where it really becomes tricky is where you have to turn this into a clinical product. You have to get through the regulatory authorities, and you have to get enough funding to perform a clinical trial. We're hoping within the next sort of 18 months to two years, that's where we're going to be. Um, we're just getting our certified manufacturing process ready now to be able to manufacture these bubbles, our data portfolio ready for the regulators, uh, and the funding for the clinical trial. So, fingers crossed, and I hope I'll be able to report back uh, in the not-too-distant future. And if that's successful, we hope this will only be the beginning. We're working very hard with colleagues in Oxford on a treatment using this technology to deliver immunotherapy for treating cancer in the brain. And also, I know we're going to hear from Dame Sally Davis uh, later this morning about using this to deliver antibiotics. Because if we need a treatment for candidate cancer, we need a treatment for antibiotics even more, and we need it yesterday. So I'd just like to end by thanking the amazing team that I work with, both in Oxford and in Ireland. I'm enormously privileged to be a part of it, and it wouldn't happen without a lot of people working very hard. And thank you for listening. <laughs>